we're going to conclude our thoughts on the subject of the history of the church. And you might wonder, why would I talk about this? Why would we use this as a series? And, I, and to me, it, it's faith building. And uh, it puts my trust in the statement that our Lord has made, that when he built the church, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And so the church through the ages, as we have looked at some of the things, the terrifying things that had happened to it, the church through the ages remained a church. And as I pointed out last night, up to this time right here, there were no denominations. Up to this time, up to about the year 1400, there was only the true church, which was in hiding, and there was the apostate church, or the Roman Catholic church, which is which it, as it became known as. Of course, it was known as other things too. The Greek Orthodox came into play. The, the Catholic Church was divided between the East and the West. I think I might have read to you the other evening, or maybe Sunday evening, when we talked a little bit about the seven churches of Asia. But I, I want you to notice again with me here in the book of Revelations. Well, let me go back to Revelations, the 11th chapter, and verse 18. The Remember I, I told you that the church, there are seven things in the book of Revelation. There are four groups of sevens. There was the seven churches. There's the seven trumpets that are blown. Uh, the seven vials that are poured out. And there are some, someone else's seven. But there's four of them that depicted, of course, the, uh, the picture of the church. Well, in Revelations, the 11th chapter, we have the seventh trumpet blown. And if my way of thinking is correct, which again, I could be completely wrong, but I think it's just a periodic period of time, one through seven. When we get to number seven, that's it. The, the, you know, the end is over. So in Revelations, the 11th chapter, this was, of course, the seventh trumpet. Begins in verse 15, talks about the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And verse 18, it says, and the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that they shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And so here he makes even mention of the fact of the judgment. And so the seventh trumpet blows, there is a judgment. Now, I, I think that in, in my view of Revelation, as I said, there is the the uh, two segments of it. And I think the first segment ended right here in the 18th verse. Uh, and this was the segment of the, uh, the, the church in the world and how the Roman Empire affected it. In fact, even how Mohammedism affected it because that's recorded in here. And just a number of things that from the outside uh, 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 affects against the church. I believe that's what was referred to in the first 11 chapters. In the next segment, it refers to the things that we have been talking about here this week about the Roman Catholic Church and how that they begin to change uh, the rulership. They begin to change the word of God. They took the word of God and hid it from the common people. And this is where in chapter 12 then we begin to read about something that happened. And we have mentioned this, of course, but let's just read it for what it says. Chapter 12, beginning with verse, uh, well, let's, let's go up to verse 5 and verse 6. And she brought forth, maybe I ought to start over here because it talks about this a little bit earlier. It says that there, let's start with verse 1 of chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now remember the book of Revelation is, is figurative. And each one of these things, of course, has a representation I, uh, I think that you'll begin to see the representation as we move along here. She, being with child, cried, to veiling in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads, and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child, as soon as it was born. So you have something that pictures, uh, that something that is able to give birth, a woman. And this child, when it is going to be born, they're going to try to destroy it, this dragon. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations 
with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Does that remind you of anything? It certainly reminds me of something. It reminds me of the man-child that was born of God. Out of this world, as he talks about the world and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and so forth, and this man-child was born and this dragon did not get to kill it. Because it says, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that she should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. We have used that, uh, point, that, that period of time several times in this study this week, but let's just uh, describe it again to you just a little bit. A thousand, two score, and three, and whatever it says there, equals 1,260 days. In Revelation, sometimes it's 1,260 years, which a day equals a year. Sometimes it's referred to as 42 months, which is equivalent, again, to the same period of time here. And so it is this, it is this what we, we refer to as the Dark Ages. It was the, the time, and we don't know necessarily when it began, uh, but, but uh, you know, it began at a certain point. And I, again, the 1,260 days or 1,260 years is just simply a period of time. But some people have actually narrowed it down to exactly 1,260 years that the church was actually hidden in the wilderness, which is described here in this particular passage. So now we come to, and, and this was, I believe, during the Dark Ages, uh, to a great degree during the Dark Ages, and when all of the things that was happening to the church, all the changes. But as I said last night, it was time for a change, and uh, that change would come about, and I, I believe, as I pointed out in my sermon Sunday night in, the, in Revelations, the third chapter, I believe that the church at Sardis represents that change. For onto the church at Sardis, after talking about how that the government took over the church, and then finally uh, the papacy was established, and and, uh, and and all these things are referred to in chapter two, he says in chapter three, beginning there with about verse two, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not find thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. We're gonna talk about maybe some of those names that had been faithful and, uh, and, and, and we're gonna to refer to it as the Reformation. Now, the next church, which is the church of Philadelphia, I think represents the restoration. But these are two distinct periods of time. As I said, it finally got so bad in the religious world that something had to take place. There was, of course, in, in the mix of all of this, beginning in 572, we haven't mentioned this yet, but there was the influence of Mohammedism, the influence of, of, of Islamism upon the church. Muhammad. Of course, you've heard of him, and we know today how uh, that those people are dead set against uh, Christians. In fact, uh, they are praised if they can eliminate what they call an unbeliever. And we are unbelievers because we don't believe, of course, the followings of Muhammad. But Muhammad was born in 572. In 622, Muhammad fled from Mecca because of mischievous things he had been doing there, and they were going to persecute him, so he left Mecca and, and, and he, he, because of his teachings, and they just didn't like what he was teaching. These were in the, this was in the Arab countries up there in what we now call Turkey and, and uh, you know, where Constantinople was and all of that. This is that whole vicinity, the Arab countries. And he set out to band all of the Arab tribes together in order that they might fight against Christianity and destroy Christianity and to conquer the world with his religion. You know, a lot of people have sought out to do that. You know, Hitler, he didn't have any religion behind him, but he sought out that he was going to conquer the world. But, he, but, but Muhammad thought he was going to conquer the world with his religion. Well, you know, that's not uh, too far from thinking even today, is it? The fact that they are seemingly taking over a lot of the world. But anyway, he didn't live long enough to see his dream come true in his lifetime and his reality. He died at the age of 62. He was a very sensual man. He had at least 14 wives. 
One of them was his own son's wife. He took her off of him. And, uh, they, and, and so this is the kind of man we're dealing with here who believed that he could do this. Now, he didn't believe you could do this, but because he had certain powers, he could have as many wives as he wanted to have. Now, continuing on about him, though, Islamism became the enemy of Christianity for the next thousand years. So from 562 on up to, what would that be, 10 years, a thousand years after that, they would put it up into 1,200 or so, 1,300 or so. For the next thousand years, the church suffered at the hands of Mohammedism as they took much of the world by wars. And one of the things that uh, you, you have to understand is that Muhammad is actually predicted in the Bible. He's actually predicted there. You remember the story of Abraham? Abraham, of course, had a child to his wife's maiden. And this child is the father of Muhammadism. Muhammad is a, is a predecessor. Is that right? Predecessor. It, it, he, is, he is a follower, of course, of this child of Abraham. And here's where it's recorded in Genesis 16, verses 11 and 12. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child. This is, of course, that handmaid that Abraham and Sarah wanted. She, she couldn't bear children, so she wanted her handmaid to, you know, bear children for her. And so the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and thou shalt bear a son. And his name shall be called Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. And Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael unto Abraham. Notice it says he'd be a wild man, and people would hate him, and he would hate people. And that's the way, of course, Mohammedanism is. Uh, it seems that there is no kindness extended or no, uh, like, like we have, of course, within Christianity, grace and mercy and things of that nature. Within Mohammedism, that is not the case. At this period of time also, I'm just bringing these things up to show you again just a little more what was happening. In this period of time, there were many crusades. In fact, there were seven major crusades. And what that was, the crusades were wars that were fought between Christians and Muslims. Actual wars, literal wars. And, uh, I mean, they were, they, they were terrible, and, and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people died because of these crusades. And what they were fighting over was a little piece of ground in Jerusalem. That's what they were fighting over. You see, because Ishmael is the father of that race, they have Abraham as their father. And then, of course, you know, Isaac and, and, uh, and Jacob and all that, they also have Abraham. So the, the, the Mohammedism, uh, they believe in the same God you believe in. They believe in Abraham and Noah and all those people, of course, you know, before Moses come along. They believe in all that. And, and they believe that Jerusalem is their possession. So even today, they hold to the temple area. You, you as a Christian can't go into that area because Mohammedism controls that area of Jerusalem. But for a long time, they controlled all of Jerusalem and nobody could go there. Uh, uh, the reason that the Crusades was because the Muslims controlled it and Christians wanted to make pilgrimages there, but they uh, could not because of the influence of Mohammedism. You know, I've been there to Jerusalem it's a very small area. In fact, probably, probably Inez is bigger than Jerusalem. And you think about hundreds of thousands of people being in that little spot of the world. But that is the most famous spot in the world for some reason. I guess they think it because of the creation of God, which I don't know if it happened there or not far from there. But, but Jerusalem is the most coveted piece of ground in the world. The Mohammedans want it and the Christians want it. And so they fought against it for over a thousand years. I, I, didn't, I, have, I, I have the seven listed on my, uh, my slides, but it would take a long time to go and describe them. But I do want to describe two of them to you to show you how ridiculous this was. There was one that was started by Peter the Hermit. Just the name itself will tell you how ridiculous this was. In 1095, and this was authorized, this was promoted and set up by the Pope of Rome. This, you know, they, these were all backed by the church, these crusades. And so the preaching of Peter the Hermit was largely responsible for the beginning of the crusades. 
There were people in France, Italy, Germany, and England. They were aroused to a high pitch of religious fervor. They were determined to deliver the city of David, which is the city of Jerusalem, from the hands of what they called the infidels. They were determined to go and take that, that land back. The Pope issued an edict granting all who would enlist in the army of the Lord the remission of their sins and promised that those who might be killed in battle would enter into life eternal if they were truly penitent. So if you were killed in battle, you had an automatic home in heaven. That was how they advertised for people to go and fight in this battle. You know, we talk about the Mohammedans and the Islams and so forth. And, you know, they have within their doctrine that if you kill an infidel, you get to have many wives in heaven. And we laugh at that and we think how terrible that is. But how terrible is this right here? That a religion would advocate that you go out and kill the enemy and you got an automatic home in heaven. What happened to the statement, thou shalt not kill? What happened to the command in the Bible, thou shalt not kill? But anyway, this was, this was the way it was. And, and uh, it was for the love of adventure and the desire for military glory and personal ambition that brought but all kinds of people, princes and nobles and poor people. And, and in fact, down here in the blue, uh, the, Peter the hermit became very impatient and he didn't wait, of course, for everything to get organized. So he marched on. He divided the command with a poor knight called Walter the Penniless. Here's, here's Peter the Hermit and Walter the Penniless going in this and leading all of these people. They said there was 80,000 people in this particular uh, movement. Uh, they were on train. They were lazy tradesmen, people who couldn't get a job anyway. They were merchants, boys, girls, slaves, malefactors, monks, and prostitutes set out for Constantinople. Thousands of them perished with hunger and exposure on the way. And when they got to the river Bosporus, they were surprised by the Turks, and all of them were slaughtered. The only other one I'll make mention of here is one that was called the Children's Crusade. There was a little boy named Stephen in France who was only 12 years old. And he thought he could do something about this. He thought he could raise an army and that they could go over there and take Jerusalem back. He was persuaded that Christ commanded him to lead a crusade of children to the Holy Land. And the children of France became wild with excitement and they flocked to his side. When the children found that they got to the Mediterranean Sea, that the water did not part like they thought it should, like they thought it, you know, or would have for Moses or whatever. When they got there and it didn't part, they didn't know what to do then at that point. And so, you know, uh, when the children found the sea did not part and give them passage to the land of Palestine, they became discouraged. A part of them returned back home. But there was uh, two merchant men's, men who, who seen an advantage here. And so they said, we'll take you to Palestine. And so they loaded them on seven little boats and hauled them across the Mediterranean Sea and sold them to the Islam people. The people that they were going to fight against, they became slaves to them. This is just two of the, the, the crusades that went on during this time. There were seven major ones. And battles and lives, many lives were killed during this period of time. This was in about the year 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, somewhere in that vicinity. And then came the Reformation. This will be read to you about in the book of Revelation 3. There are a few that have not left their faith. There are a few that still, whose names are quite important. And there were many movements before Martin Luther, but Martin Luther is considered as the originator of the Reformation, but he was not. In fact, it was a thousand or more years before Martin Luther that it began to, to process, and it began to come about. As I said, it was, there were several things that, uh, that, that brought it about, but there was, I'm sure, I know my grandpa used to talk about these, the Hussites, in Bohemia, there was the John Wycliffe in England, and John Wycliffe is the one that is given the credit for giving us the English Bible. He and two others translated from the Latin language into the English Bible. And there still is today a Wycliffe society that all they do is translate the Bible from languages, uh, from, from the original writings to their language. In fact, I got to talk to some of them years ago uh, in the Philippines. In the Philippines, there's 80-some different dialects, 
And so, you, you know, you, you, you have to have a Bible for each one of them. And so there was one that was way up on the northern edge on a little island, you know, or kind of a, a seacoast there on the China Sea. And you couldn't get to it by land. It was impossible to get to by land unless you wanted to be eaten up by mosquitoes and leeches. And so they, there was a, uh, the Wycliffe Bible Society had gone in there and they had them in an airport and they flew in there and we contacted them and I went down to their, their uh, place of, uh, of work and it was fascinating just to talk to these people. They said it takes 13 years. They send people into this community for 13 years to learn the language and to learn what every word means and then they can take the Bible and translate it into that language. That's quite a task, isn't it? 13 years. They were about to finish up in this little place. We've got a church there. It's called Bolus Point. And, 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 uh, and so, you know, it, that's the reason we wanted to go in there. Well, their plane was broke down. We didn't get to go that time. But, but uh, you know, it just fascinated me that this society is engaged in that work. It's, it's a tremendous work to be able to put the Bible in the language of the people. But anyway, John Wycliffe died because he started this, because he did translate the Bible, but he was one of the original. The Albigenses in southern France, Erasmus, he was a one-man show. Erasmus was a one-man show, but he was, a, he was a priest from the Catholic Church, but he believed that intellectually people could be changed. And he realized that if you could teach people, if you, could, if you had the ability to give them words to read or be able to to share with them you know the truth that that this would change the world and this would change things he was on the right track but he was a one-man show you know he didn't have a lot of force behind him he did not have a lot of authority he did not have a lot of i suppose respect whatever it took you know as far as the uh, intelligent world was concerned but he was on the right track martin luther though as i said is given the credit for the main part of the reformation October the 31st, of course, a lot of, a lot of things led up to this, but October the 31st, 1517, Luther posted 95 questions to the Catholic Church at the castle Wittenberg, Germany. He took it up and he pounded it on the door and these were 95 things that he found was wrong with the church at that time. And, and, and he was a part of it. He was one of the priests or the monks or whatever that belonged to him. And he found this in his study, his own study, because they had access to the Latin language or to the Latin Bible, but nobody else did. And this is regarded as the beginning of the Reformation. Luther was not trying to destroy, though, the Catholic Church. He was just trying to reform it. He was trying to make it better. He had no problem with it, but he was just trying to make it better. The church tried to destroy him as a heretic, but he had too much popularity. That was what made the difference between Martin Luther and, and uh, you know, the other ones uh, that I, I mentioned here. Uh, Martin Luther, because of his, somehow his position within the church, he had too much popularity and, and he had too much fight in him. He was not willing to give up and to walk away and he stood on his position. He was told to recant these things. He was told to repent of this or he would meet with consequences. And uh, when all efforts failed to get Martin Luther to repent, there was a papal bull. And what this was, it was a writing from the Pope that this man is to be ostracized, he's to be excommunicated, and, 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 and even perhaps maybe he is to be destroyed or to be killed or to be eliminated. And that's what a papal bull was. And a papal bull was directed against him and his life being in danger. He went into seclusion at the castle of Wartburg. And during this time, he finished the translation from Latin to the German language. So now we've got, we've got an, another language at least for people to be able to read and become educated with the Word of God. Remember up until this time, I mean, this is the year, uh, what was it, 15 something. Up until this time, there's only one language that the Bible's in. And the world's filled with all kinds of languages and people. And, and, and they only were allowed to hear what the church wanted them to hear. Luther had broken the stronghold of papal Rome by giving people back the Bible. And what caused Martin Luther to be so riled up was the sale of indulgences. That's what, you know, you can go too far and things get so ridiculous. And this was one of the areas where the church became so ridiculous. The church was in need of money. 
It was broke. And, and, uh, and, and so in order to raise money, they offered to sell the right to sin. That's what the sale of indulgences are. And there was a man by the name of John Texel, which was hired by the church and sent out by the Pope to sell these rights to sin. Here's a picture of that very thing. I told you last night, he had this little wagon, kind of like, you know, the old medicine wagon type thing. He had this little wagon. He had an orchestra with him that would announce his presence coming into every little city and town. And then he would stand there and he would do his little speech and he would hand out these papers. And you could buy the right to sin. You could buy the right to commit fornication. Just about anything uh, that, that, that you wanted. And uh, again, you know, how, how, how far uh, will, will religion go just to satisfy their own means and to be able to raise money? But this is the thing that got the ire of Martin Luther and so many others. He went around very much, as I said, like the medicine. And, they, and, and according to what we find that is written about this, here is the speech that he would give, this textual fellow. He said, my brethren, God has sent me to you with his last and greatest gift. The church is in bad need of money. At least they were honest about it. The church, the church was in bad need of money. And I am empowered by the Pope, God's vice chairman to absolve you of any and every crime you may have committed, no matter what it may be. The moment the money sinkles into the box, your soul shall be as pure as that of a babe on board. What a speech. And people, of course, would line up for this because that was an easy way out, you see, and you could just get rid of your sin immediately. There's no one to But before Martin Luther, there was John Wycliffe, and I've mentioned him a little bit here already, 1354. He denounced the Pope. He was, he was a part of the Roman Catholic Church. But he denounced the Pope as the Antichrist. He declared that the scriptures alone contain the things that are essential to salvation. He was right. The scriptures alone will save you. He was accused of heresy on 19 accounts. He was ordered <coughs> arrested by Pope Gregory XI. But no one in England would do it because of his influence. You see, the Pope's up in Rome, so he has to order it for somebody down in England to do it, and nobody would do it because they liked John Wycliffe, and nobody would arrest him. He taught against transubstantiation, which is, uh, it has, that transubstantiation, I really don't understand the fullness of that, but it has to do with the communion, that in the, in the Catholic Church, in every Catholic Church in the whole world, there will be a slab it's a rectangular table, just like you have here, but every, uh, every church has one. And they literally believe that when they have communion, Jesus is crucified again and again and again, and that we're eating of that blood and, and eating body and drinking that blood. And, and it becomes a, instead of a spiritual thing, it's, it seems like it becomes a, a, a literal thing. Well, John Wycliffe taught against that. He taught against purgatory. Purgatory is something that's not in your Bible, but it's in the Catholic Bible. And purgatory is that there's seven levels. When you die, you go to one of these seven levels. And if you are rich, you get to the hottest part. And then it goes down from there. If you're very poor, you're just kind of lukewarm down there, but it's still hot enough you don't want to stay in purgatory. And the reason for that is because people will pay to get their loved ones out of purgatory into heaven. And that's what they did. That was a money-raising thing. Especially if, you're, if you was a rich fella and you died, your family would pay big dollars to get you out of there pretty quick. I sometimes, uh, I sometimes my Gail's family, and I don't make fun of them at all, but Leroy, he was, he was a character. And uh, so he told his family, he said, now when I die, he says, uh, you get me close, he said, and then stop paying because I'm going to jump on in. <laughs> That's what he told me. That's what the story you would tell. But you see, the people make fun of that stuff. But it was real. It was real. And, and, and they did it as a money-making thing. He taught against that. He taught against the indulgences, and he taught against the confessions and the confessionals to priests, realizing that we don't go through a man to ask for God's forgiveness. We pray ourselves to God for forgiveness. Wycliffe and Nicholas Herford and Richard Kirby. <laughs> 
are the three men that worked hand in hand together to give us the English speaking Bible in our language. Of course, it, 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 would, it would be a, a, a language that you probably couldn't read even now because it's the old English, and of course it would have to eventually be translated into our type, but, but at least it was well on its way. He became paralyzed the last day of 1384 and died a few days later, and he was buried. And after his burial, the Catholic Church hated him so bad that they dug his body back up, and they burned it, and his ashes were thrown into the Avon River. That's how bad they hated him. They, they weren't satisfied that he died. They were going to persecute him by burning his dead body over again. John Huss is another individual. These are names that I think maybe the book of Revelation was referring to. You have a few names that have held on to the truth. Now, these guys, we probably wouldn't have fellowshiped them today. We probably wouldn't fellowship John Wycliffe or John Huss or Martin Luther. But you see, they only had a short period of time to live. I believe these men would have been able to accept all the truth had they been able to live long enough. But they weren't able to live long enough. But they were on the right track. They knew what was right because they knew what finally the Bible said as they translated it into their language. The word of White Wycliffe spread to Bohemia where the, they were accepted by a professor of the University of Prague. Now this was a very intelligent man. This was a very well uh, prestigious individual. And through his leadership, through John Huss, who is that professor, through his leadership, Charles, King of Germany, and the Bohemian Church broke away from the Papal Church and became a separate institution. So now you have three, at least. You see you have the Greek Orthodox. You have, of course, the Roman Catholic. Now you have the Bohemian segment of this particular religion. And they broke away. Huss became a hero in the sight of the people there in Germany and Bohemia. And, and the efforts of the church to suppress him failed as they could not get to him. But Huss was cast into prison eventually for his preaching. And he was labeled a heretic. He refused to obey the order of the council which commanded him to plead guilty. And he was burned at the stake on July the 6th, 1415 because of his preaching the truth. That's how much they did not want the truth preached. They put him to death. They burned him. He was taken to the post to be burned. When the wood had been lighted, he lifted up his voice, they said, to God in him, and closed it by saying, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on me. While the flames were coming up around him. When his body was consumed with ashes, they were carefully gathered up and thrown into the Rhine River. Jerome of Prague. The disciple Huss was also burned a year later after him. And then came the Renaissance. This is a period of time you read about or taught in school, the Renaissance. You have the Dark Ages, and then it goes from the Dark Ages into the Renaissance. And the Renaissance was a wonderful period of time. Learning was reborn. It was brought about largely by the invention of the printing press by John Gutenberg in Mainz, Germany. Up to this time, everything, even the Bibles that were printed, had to be done by hand. Wouldn't that be quite a task? Even just this little Bible right here would be, it would be many months and months to be able to write this all by hand. And you had to be very careful. And that's why, you know, when, when Jesus talked about the jots and the tittles, he says, you know, the, the jots and the tittles will not pass until all is fulfilled. Well, the Greek language in which the Bible, the New Testament at least, was written had all these dots and these slashes and so forth. And each one of those things gave precedence to a certain word. It, 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 it accented it, either made it a negative or a positive. And so you had to do all that. And so they, they, they had to write all this down. And you had to make sure you had every jot and every tittle, you know, uh, uh, that, that, was, that was in there. In fact, the scribes who did this, it's interesting to, to study about how the Bible came about. But the scribes who did this, they knew exactly on a page, they knew exactly on this page how many syllables there were. They knew exactly how many dots and dashes and the Greek alphabet was on this one page. And after they had written that one page, it had to be tested or it had to be read by somebody else and every one of them counted. And if there's 358 syllables on this page 
and they only counted 359, it was thrown away and it was started over again because it wasn't the right number of syllables on the page. That's, that was their, their you know, way of testing whether or not everything was written as it should be. Every page had to have the exact number of syllables upon it. Uh, the first book that was printed on this Gutenberg printing press was the Latin Bible. And the Bible now being studied by the common man revealed the discrepancies of the will of God in the Catholic Church. Within 20 years of the invention of the printing press, every major city in Europe had one. And the world was provided the means of spreading the gospel. This was a lot, in, in large part, how this Reformation was able to do its great work. Because now truth was being made known. And you, if you had the opportunity to have a Bible, then you could see for yourself. There was another man by the name of Savonarola in 1482. He came to Florence, Italy in 1482, a young, prominent preacher and a philosopher. His way of teaching was as the crowds literally flocked to him. You know, there's some people that just attract others. There are some people that have the ability to speak. You'll sit there for hours and hours and hours, and then there's some you couldn't stand 15 minutes. But Savonarola was one of those that you could just sit there all day long and listen to him. They said Alexander Campbell was that way. They said he'd preach for hours and hours and then he'd, he'd end his sermons. And, and, uh, and, and, and they, the guys would say, well, why is he quitting so early? You know, because you just become wrapped up. And Savonarola was that way. He was a hellfire and brimstone preacher. You ever hear of them? A hellfire and brimstone preacher is what Savonarola was. Those who came to jeer him ended up crying. <laughs> and they, those who, who, who were engaged in sins, he taught, he, he taught to shun bad companions against vile songs and wicked books and dances and carnivals. Imagine preaching against carnivals and all kinds of this entertainment. But people were hungry for that and they wanted that. And the poets and the scholars were so moved and convinced that they brought their bad books and their seductive homes, and they burned them at the church house door. That's how much power Savonarola had. His popularity became so great that the Pope became alarmed. Listen to this now. The Pope became alarmed that people would stop sinning and the money would stop flowing. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you think about that. They, they got afraid that, you know, he's going to straighten up the world, and so we've got to do something about this so people can continue to sin so the money keeps flowing in. He was offered a red hat of a cardinal by the Pope. If you just stop preaching what you're doing, I'll give you a red hat. And here's what Mr. Savonarola said. He said, a red hat. He said, I wish for no other red hat than that of martyrdom, reddened with my own blood. Eventually, he was seized by a vicious mob. He was charged with heresy. He was hanged and his body burned and his ashes thrown into the Arnold River. There must have been something about throwing ashes into the river. You know, I guess so that they would just wash away or something, but they made sure that they always threw the ashes into the river. So again, this was the end of Savonarola. Eurek Zwingli, 1484. This is all before Martin Luther now, mind you, but it said Martin Luther had the stamina to stand up and really make it last. And he was an early former from Switzerland, Zwingli was. Zwingli assailed the doctrine of the Roman Church on 67 points. Now, Martin Luther had 95, he had 67 points. And he defended them so successfully before the council at Zurich that they charged all the clergy of Zurich to preach the same thing. So he was able to convert a whole country of priests to preach the same thing that he was preaching. Before 800 people, he attacked the doctrine of the Mass. And through his labors in Switzerland, the organs were removed from all the churches. You see that by this time, by 1484, an instrument of music was brought into the church. And in Switzerland, he was able to cause all the organs to be removed. And the loaf and the cup were administered to the entire congregation. At some point, way back there, they would not allow the, uh, they would allow you, the communicants, to drink from the cup, the one cup. The Catholic Church has always had one cup, but they would not let the congregants to, to drink of that. They would just only give them the wafer. Well, Mr. Zwingli, he 
was able to reinstate that, at least in all the churches of Zurich, that all the communicants would drink from that cup and they would eat from the one bread. Now, somewhere down along the line, they changed it again because you don't get to drink of the cup. Uh, in, in the Catholic Church, I've been to many of funerals and, and helped to, with the, uh, the conducting those funerals, and they give everybody a little wafer, but you don't get to drink the cup. Only the priest gets to drink that. And I, one of these days, I'm going to ask them. I get real close to one of those guys because they'll stand up there and they read it. I mean, they read it right out of the book, and it reads exactly that part. Reads exactly like your Bible does where it says, you know, that he gave the cup to them and told them to all drink of it. I'm going to ask them, do you believe what you're even reading? <laughs> they must not believe what they're reading. Anyway, here's Zwingli. He claimed the true church consisted of those who believe in Christ and obey his word and not the words of the clergy alone. Zwingli wanted to exclude everything from the church that was not authorized by the scriptures. We're on the right road now, you see, Zwingli. And long can, as I said, along comes uh, Mr. Uh, Martin Luther and many others of that period of time. Okay, there is a need then for restoration. Because what we have now at this particular point in time, in the latter part of the 1400s, the beginning of the 1500s, what we have now is something worse than we had before. Because what we had before, we had the true church and we had the false church. You only had one decision to make. But now as each one of these individuals, Mr. Zwingli and Martin Luther and John Huss, the Hussites and the Aborigines and Aboriginites or whatever they were called, they, they, they all you know, went their different ways with their different beliefs. Each one of them could see something in the church was wrong and they kind of honed in on that one thing. But they kept a lot of the other things that they didn't want to give up on. So all that was created was more little groups going in different directions. First of all, originally you had the Greeks separate from the Romans in 1054. You have John Huss's group, the Hussites, separated from Catholicism in 1457. You have the Lutherans. They broke over doctrinal practices, and their leader was Martin Luther. Now, one of the things that Martin Luther did say, and this is recorded, this is written in history, Martin Luther said, do not call yourself after my name, but recall yourself after him who died for you. Mr. Martin Luther didn't want this recognition of being a Lutheran. He wanted you to be only a Christian, except the fact that Mr. Martin Luther died and his followers stopped where Martin Luther stopped, and they went no further in their direction or their climb out of error. Uh, the Episcopalian Church, 1534, this is the Church of England. It broke with the Catholic Church because of Henry VIII, who wanted to, uh, you know, to, to divorce his wife and marry another woman. And, the, and, and Catholicism would not allow that, so he started his own religion. It's the Church of England, but in America it's called the Episcopalian. John Calvin came into play. He was influenced by Martin Luther, but he differed with Luther on the music issue. Martin Luther did not believe in mechanical instruments. I, 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 I've, I've read some of the statements that Martin Luther made about that. He said, he, he said it's kind of like a cowbell in a, in a worship service, you know. It just, it just it, it did not fit, and it, it was not scriptural. But John Calvin believed that you could have instruments in the worship. And so he parted from Martin Luther. So now you've got, you know, Martin Luther, and then you've got a group segmented it off of the Lutheran bunch. And these people were called, of course, the Presbyterians, and still called the Presbyterians today. Uh, they became known as the Huguenots in France. They were the Puritans in England. The Puritans were those who came to America in search of the new country, you remember, and then Presbyterians in Scotland. There was the Congregational Church started in England in 1550 by Robert Brown. They became known as the Pilgrims in 1620 that came to America. The Baptist was started by a man by the name of John Smith in 1607, having separated from the Congregationist Church and, uh, and, and, and over sprinkling and infant baptism. You know, they, there was this issue whether or not Again, infant baptism was something that the church had held on to for years, the apostate church, and, and there were still those who weren't willing to give all that up. And so the Baptist church was separated over that issue. In 1960, there was actually 27 different groups of the Baptist church. 
free will and whatever others there are, but there's 27 in 1960. There was the Church of the Brethren. They were known as German Baptists or Dunkers. Um, very similar, I suppose, to the Amish and the Mennonites and so forth. That, that, that particular segment or area, they separated from the Presbyterians. So now you have, listen to this now, you have Martin Luther separating from Catholicism. You have John Calvin separating from Martin Luther. Now you have another group or two or three other groups separating from them. And each one of them carrying with them their own little doctrine. John Wesley was a very prominent man during these days. He opposed the formation of the Church of England. He opposed King Henry VIII in forming that and so forth. And John Wesley is the father of the Methodist Church. Every Methodist Church comes from this man right here. Uh, and, and he broke up from the uh, Church of England in 1739. Uh, during this time, there were many creeds that were also developed. A creed is a, is a document other than the Bible. You know, instead of just taking the Bible as your creed and your instruction book, they decided they needed to have a set of rules. And so the Articles of Faith was printed by the Episcopal Church in 1563. Westminster Confession of Faith by the Presbyterians in 1646, and neither one of them would work together. Neither one of them would be in unity with each other. And then you had the Methodist dis Discipline, and then you had the New Hampshire Confession of Faith by the Calvinistic Baptists, and then you have the Philadelphia Confession of Faith, and I don't know who that belonged to, but you had all of these various creeds out there telling people how to go to heaven. All different and not working at all with each other. So you see from the work of the Reformation, it was a step in the right direction, but it created a bigger problem. The world, because of this, was turning atheistic. In 1791, I don't know if you've studied in history about the French Revolution, and this, I believe, is spoken of in the Bible, the three and a half years where the two prophets was left dead in the streets. Remember reading about that? This is, as far as I'm concerned, this is it right here. For three and a half years, the nation of France outlawed God, period. They outlawed God. It's called the French Revolution. They, there, were, there were so many people killed in that revolution because, you know, they, any, if you had anything to do with religion or you were promoting religion of any kind, you were killed. You were murdered. And during this French Revolution, for three and a half years, they outlawed God, which meant anything that had a connection to God no longer existed. So the seven-day week no longer existed because that belongs to God. The laws of marriage no longer existed because the laws of marriage exist with God. And on and on and on. And finally, at the end of about three and a half years, you know, uh, uh, they, they came to their senses and, and came back and began to embellish or begin to accept the Word of God. But during this time, in the 1790s, 1800s, in America, the influence of Thomas Paine and Robert Owen were very strong because they were connected with this French Revolution. In the last years of the 18th century, which is what's the 1790s, somewhere in that area, in the last years of the 18th century, only 10% of America was only connected with any religion. That's how bad it got. I mean, they, people got so discouraged and they got so confused because of all the rigid religious turmoil and religions fighting against each other and all that, they finally just gave up. Only 10% of America was religious of any kind. In America, in the early colonies and statehood, there was much division because of these religious groups. There was a need for a change again. We had the need for the change for the Reformation. We have a need for the change called the Restoration. The Restoration began in England, as far as we know, but it didn't get much foothold there and it didn't get much, much progress in England. But we know that it was started there because there is a writing in a minute book, and I saw a picture of this minute book. It's, it's on record on file. A minute book recorded in 1669 of the churches of the district of Lancashire in northwest England, where it shows that this church called themselves the Church of Christ, 
They practiced baptism by immersion. They celebrated the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, and they had elders and deacons. So here is those churches coming out of the woodwork. Here are these churches that have been kept alive, I believe, in the wilderness that Revelation 12 talked about. They're coming out in the open now. This is in 1669 when all this other foolish stuff was going on. Now, it moved to America, and what is fascinating is, and I, I said Sunday night, I know, um, I know I'm going over here, but I, I got to finish this tonight. In, Re in Revelations, the third chapter, y'all talk a bunch afterwards anyway, so you can just go home when we're done. <laughs> in Revelations 3, you know the church at Philadelphia? I think this is it right here. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and thou hast kept my word, and thou hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. God's going to open a door, he said, that no man's going to shut. And this is the restoration. This is when it took place. And what was fascinating was it all started independent of each other, but it all started at the same time. It was God's time. It was the right time for God to bring this about. Dr. Abner Jones in 1801, way up there in Hartford, Connecticut, he left the Baptist church and established churches throughout the area calling themselves Christians only. There was no adjectives or no description of who they were. They were just Christians. Elias Smith in New Hampshire established churches known as the Church of Christ. James O'Kelly, this was in the 1800s. James O'Kelly, a former Methodist, left the established church and he called them Christian. Uh, Martin Stone, your own local fellow right here in the state of Kentucky. Martin Stone left the Church of England and started the work that is the Episcopalian Church is what he belonged to. He started the work of restoration in Kentucky, and he worked parallel with Alexander Campbell. And Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell, those two names go hand in hand together as far as the restoration is concerned. The Cane Ridge meeting, we had the opportunity, I think uh, you, you all went over there, and, and me and Billy and Melinda and Gail, we went over there. It's not far from here if you ever get a chance. It's just fascinating. And it's fascinating for me because this Cane Ridge meeting is uh, houses out in the middle of nowhere, literally. I mean, there's no towns around it. It's just farmland. And at that time, they had a gospel meeting that lasted for six days and six nights. It was attended by 20 to 30,000 people. Can you imagine 20 to 30,000 people emerging on Inez, Kentucky? And it's got some stores. But up there, there was no stores. It's just wild. It's just out in the country. And if you get a chance to go up there, the old log building church, the, one of the oldest in the country, still exists. And they had this meeting there. And what it was is that there were actually several branches of religions there. There was Episcopalian. There was Presbyterian. I suppose there was some Baptist or whatever. And they were all there, and people were, were ready. Because remember, you know, 10% of the people were only religious. They were thirsty for something. And so you would not call these people Church of Christ in that meeting, in Cane Ridge meeting. You would not call them that because they came from various religions. But all at one time, five major preachers, of which Barton Stone was one of them, they all began to teach the doctrines that you and I now accept. They all began, baptism was, as I said, it was done by sprinkling and so forth. They all began to accept immersion for baptism. And they began to talk about the, 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 the churches being autonomous and the, the government of the church and all that. They all seemed to come to the same conclusion at the same time. And that, uh, as I said, there were five preachers. They were excommunicated from their churches for teaching the things that they taught. But Martin Stone went on and became a great asset to the church. Alexander Campbell was the leader of the Restoration. He was a Presbyterian and couldn't get along and could not accept the doctrine that they taught. Then he became a Baptist and then he learned the truth on baptism. Thomas Campbell was his father. And they met and their little church building is up here in, in West Virginia, uh, Bethany, West Virginia. And we've actually held meetings up there in Bethany, West Virginia. And it's just kind of, it's kind of neat to stand in the same pulpit that Alexander Campbell stood in. 
But anyway, you know, they, 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 their force was, and he was such an intelligent individual. And Thomas Campbell is the one that came up with a little saying that become the byword, I guess, of, of the church. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. And that's what the restoration is built on. Don't say anything that the Bible, don't teach anything the Bible doesn't teach. And don't forget anything that the Bible does teach. Campbell was one of the smartest men that ever lived. He published the Christian Baptist and later called the Millennial Harbinger. This was a writing of a paper that I think probably some of you know because Brother Phillips, you know, he actually he was, uh, Brother Phillips was a part of this restoration. He's one of the last preachers that we would refer to as being a part of the restoration. I've read a lot of his history and the history about him and the people he was connected with. So he was a very, uh, a very important man in this restoration as well. And anyway, Raccoon John Smith and John Rogers. Now, if you ever get a book about Raccoon John Smith, read it. It's the most fascinating book you'll ever read. I, I'm not much of a reader, but I couldn't put it down when I started reading. He was quite a preacher. Raccoon John Smith came home one time. He, he, and he was the, the, you know, the, the horseback preacher. You know, he went and held all these meetings. And they said he'd get to a church where the church had locked the door and wouldn't let him preach. He'd get up on a stump outside and get, it, get all these people together. And he had a very unique way, especially with a name like Raccoon John Smith. You know he had to bend country. And so he preached with such power and force. And, uh, but, but he came home one time on one of his travels uh, on horseback and he didn't even have time to stop at the house. He just stopped at the gate. His wife took and gave him new clothes and took his old clothes and he kept on going. <laughs> but he did have 11 kids, so I guess he stopped sometime. I don't know, he had, he had a bunch of children. <laughs> but he came home one time. Here's the, here's the sad story. He came home one time and he found his house in ashes. And his wife sitting on a log right in front. And she had lost two children in that fire. And she was sitting there till he came home. And she died not too long after that. And he went into a mental, sort of a mental situation because of, uh, of, of the experience itself. The John Raccoon Smith and John Rogers were hired by Barton Stone's group and the Alexander group to work together. And their job was to travel all over the country and bring this two groups and unite them together. Barton Stone, he referred to himself as Christian. The Christian church is attributed to him. And of course, Alexander Campbell, he was called the Disciples of Christ but the Church of Christ is attributed to him. And so the Christian Church and the Church of Christ, they needed to be brought together. I mean, there wasn't much that they differed on at that particular point. And so for many years, these two men would travel and uniting these groups together with that very statement, where the Bible speaks, we speak, where the Bible is silent, we are silent. And because of these, the works of the Church of Christ was the largest group of religious people in the United States at that time. I don't think we, uh, we, we appreciate that or understand that very much. But in 1830, one half of the Baptist churches in Ohio had embraced the Church of Christ. Half of them had changed in 1830. This is about the time, you know, of the Civil War, 1840, 1850, 1860. That's when all of this was going on. And they had gone, and in 1828, there's a letter that's out there that was written to Alexander Campbell that said, I have in traveling 2,500 miles from home found only four preachers you've not corrupted. That's kind of a unique way of saying it. And the power of Mr. Alexander Campbell, he said, I've found four that you haven't corrupted. It was, a, it was a great time for the church. In 1836, the church was the fourth largest in America, numbering over 100,000. Between 1850 and 1860, for 10 years, the Church of Christ was the number one church in America, numbering over 200,000. That doesn't seem like a lot of people now today, but back in 1850 and 1860, that was a lot of people. It was number one as far as numbers were concerned. 
by 1870, 10 years later, it was back down to number five again in America. The church was and is being restored. And I'm thankful that I live in this era of time where the church has been restored because you just look at all the lives and all the people that struggle to be able to get to the church to be at this point that it is today. So let's keep it alive, brothers and sisters. Let's work at it. Let's strive for unity. Let's try to do everything we can to be able to, if, if there's something with, that, that we are doing that is wrong, that is, a, that is not recorded in the Bible, let's do away with it. If there's something that we're not doing that is recorded in the Bible, let's do it. See, see sometimes in, a church holds on to traditions. And, and, and traditions, you know, sometimes become law. But, but we just got to take the Bible and where it speaks, we speak. And where it is silent, we are silent. We never know the minds of those who are present, but I want to tell you something. If you want to be a part of the greatest institution in the world, this is it right here. It's been through an awful lot, and as I said, it's never been destroyed. It's just been secretly hiding until now we have it in the fullness. There's, there's one other thing I do want to describe to you. I know Gail's going to really give it to me tonight. <laughs> Revelations 20, okay? Revelations 20, where it talks about the thousand-year reign in verse 6. Did you know that there's two thousand-year reigns in Revelation 20? I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. What I've been talking to you about right here today, the Reformation and the Restoration, I believe is that binding. The only thing that can bind Satan is the Word of God. And so though and we may speculate on what the thousand years represents, that's the only thing that will bind Satan is the Word of God. Jesus proved that when he was tempted by Satan. He said, it is written, and Satan had to leave. He couldn't do anything with that. So I believe that the Reformation and the Restoration is this period of time where Satan was bound for a thousand years. Cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal over him and he, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. I don't know if you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking, but I think he's been loosed, don't you? I think he's been loosed. Every power, every sin that is known to man, every force that to, to, to take away man's morality, to take away man's religion and so forth, is just as open and just as plain as can be. So, you know, he was bound during this period of time and all this reformation and restoring but he's loose for a little season. That's where we've got to be very careful because he will do everything he can to destroy us. If you're here tonight and you wish to obey the gospel, won't you come? If you're here and you want to repent of wrongs, would you not come and we'll pray for you and with you. We ask you to come as we stand and sing this selected hymn.